Check this thing out. The opportunities there are that they could, uh, when uh, you know you're graduating or if you have time in the summer, uh, they have cruises and you can go on for various lengths of time. And they're very expensive unless you're acting as a TA or uh, something like that. And when you graduate with a degree in tax, they might be interested in using the course under their seminars. Let's watch for that when it comes around early in October. <coughs> also, I sent you a course web notice about a film called Encounter Point, which is like a very, very moving documentary of Israelis and Palestinians who are crossing over and trying to make these person-to-person -person contacts uh, between the two communities, something that is necessary, has limited usefulness, but if you play it right, it can be far away. And I don't remember if I mentioned this, but several of you went to see that film, Munubai, Lagen uh, Keep Going, Munubai. And it, apparently it's very funny and was very uh, acceptable to the students from the class who went there in terms of its presentation of Gandhi. So I haven't seen it yet. I'm usually very hard to please when it comes to Gandhi movies. That's why I made my own. But uh, for everything I've heard, it's at least extremely funny. So we'll try and get a hold of it when it, when it comes out on DVD. And if you have friends in Fremont and want to go down there and give it a, a once over, we'll just go ahead and try that. Um, okay, there was a question right at the end of last time from Dan, I think, who doesn't seem to be here yet. But I'm going to answer his question anyway, very briefly. He challenged me because I had. Uh, quoted Gandhi's correspondence with Tolstoy, very brief, but uh, very important. And in it, the two of them had agreed that what Gandhi was doing in South Africa was at least in some sense unique. Gandhi said that, uh, both of them said that, of course, nonviolent interactions happen all the time. You even know a case of dogs suffering from hot so you know that this goes way, way back in our pre-human evolution. But uh, this was the first time that someone had deliberately taken it. We're answering your question. Someone had deliberately taken it and turned it into a social movement, a political struggle. And so the question was, what about the whole era of martyrdom in the first centuries of Christianity? And I, I said rather quickly, that wasn't nonviolence. But I want to back away from that a little bit and say that it was partly nonviolence. The, uh, Church fathers themselves, like Augustine and others, were constantly repeating after the persecutions had run their course. And by the way, we will be talking about this in some detail in a few weeks. But Augustine and others were constantly repeating that what made the church thrive was amorientibus et non repugnantibus Christianis, that the Christians did not fight back. It was in their death that the cause was advanced. And that was, uh, I think that is partly, or at least as far as we've said so far, that was a nonviolent effect. But we're going to be talking about scapegoating, and we're going to be talking about the scapegoating system. We're going to be talking about a group of Christians, at least they considered themselves Christians, and some of the early Gnostic movements who felt that scapegoating was so violent that you shouldn't participate in it even as a victim if you didn't want to perpetuate the system. So I, I think at, for the salvation of my soul, I'm going to back off a little bit on my uh, and, uh, you know, flat out rejection of martyrdom as nonviolence. And 
and say that it wasn't um, always coordinated and it wasn't always entered into deliberately. Sometimes it was. You'll have people like uh, Polycarp uh, saying, you know, don't interfere when they come to take me. This is what the church needs. Um, I'm going to say that it, it was sort of a borderline thing that had some nonviolent energy in it, but it wasn't deliberately and specifically organized into a long-term movement. So if Gandhi's movement did anything that was new in history, as far as they knew at that time, here I am fudging again, good, good academic covering my tracks. Uh, we'll be talking about episodes in early Jewish history, which were rather well coordinated, apparently deeply embedded in the culture. Jeff, there's one here if you can stand it. Um, but as far as they knew, what he was doing was unique in history and that he was capturing this kind of energy and strategically organizing it and deliberately using it over the long term for a political goal. And that's what Gandhi and Tolstoy agreed on. He also, Gandhi also said, in a letter that he wrote to Tolstoy in 1909 on his way back from Britain, where he wrote this letter and also Hate Swaraj, which we're going to talk about a bit on Thursday, Gandhi said, in my opinion, this struggle of the Indians in the Transvaal is the greatest of modern times. Actually, he was the only one who saw it that way. Everybody else thought it was a very minor struggle compared to the unionization of South Africa, and it's, it wasn't going to be British, and if so, in what sense? What were the four entities going to be in relation to one another? They were very exercised about that, and the Indian struggle seemed very minor <coughs> to most people, but for Gandhi, it was the biggest struggle in world history. Um, okay, it's the greatest of modern times in as much it has, as it has been idealized, both as to the goal as also the methods adopted to reach the goal. In other words, it's a good goal that we're striving for, and we're going to use moral good means to get there. And that is what Gandhi felt was unique about it. I, he goes on, I am not aware of a struggle in which participators are not to derive any personal advantage at the end of it. Right? And you're all familiar with this from Bhagavad Gita personal proofs, and in which 90% have undergone great suffering and trial for the sake of a principle. So it was the idealism of the movement and the way it was thoroughly incorporated in both the mechanisms and the outcome that for Gandhi really made it uh, unique. And uh, it also, I can't, no, it's not that kind of speaker. You'll have to get me off the web. That's funny, when I was growing up in New York, nobody ever told me it was hard to hear me. They said the opposite. <laughs> but I'll speak louder soon. Um, so, the, so there were two questions that uh, had been raised. Was, what was new about the movement and is martyrdom nonviolent? I fudged on the second question and I think I've given you on the first one. Okay, so let's continue. I thought of a word for what we're doing here. Uh, you've heard of punctuated evolution, punctuated equilibrium. This is punctuated history in that I am going through the events roughly in chronological order with a certain amount of rabbit tracking and running back. And I'm picking out of it the things that seem to me to be important for all time. So that's why it would be very, very helpful for you to be reading it also in Nanda or Fisher or some other historically oriented biography. So you get a sense of what exactly the events were in sequence from a political historical point of view. I can guarantee you that on the midterm and probably also on the final as well, you will have an essay question which will say, describe either the South African phase or the Indian phase of Gandhi's career and pull out of it some main principles of nonviolence. So this will be both in the short term and the long term in the sense that you'll be a brilliant performer in cocktail parties from now on.
short term and long term can be very useful for you to have the history solidly uh, as a background for what I'm coming from. And today, uh, we're going to have a mix, I think, of strategic and principal uh, items that I want to pull out of history. So we had stopped in about uh, 1909, I think, and then I raced very quickly through the remaining episodes. And I'm going to go back over them now and talk about them in some detail. Um, but I wanted to read you part of uh, Nanda's comment on the first Satyagraha movement, up, which was in 1907, before he even goes on that trip to England. Um, let's see. Gandhi received two months simple imprisonment. This was uh, for not taking out a registration card, or burning them actually. No, burning was going to come a year later. If the government had hoped to break the spirit of the rank and file, by locking up their leader, they had made a serious miscalculation. Now we have our own special term for those kinds of miscalculation. We call that the, uh, what do you call that? We're going to need it again and again and again, fortunately, even in real life. I'll give you a hint. It starts with paradox. Thanks, yes, it's a paradox of repression. It means that you can get the regime against which you're struggling in such a, a fix that they have to use methods to hold you down, or they think they do, which will backfire. And I think I pointed out that this doesn't always work. Sometimes they use oppressive measures and you get oppressed. But I think there are two phases in the nonviolent struggle when the paradox of repression is usually going to work to your advantage. And that is in the very beginning, which we're seeing now, when people's enthusiasm is high and looking around for a way to get tangled. Uh, and after things have dragged on for a long time and people are starting to lose enthusiasm, very often there'll be what we called in the free speech movement many years ago an atrocity. We would, always, you know, we would go home for Thanksgiving break and come back and find that the administration had thrown everybody in jail or had done something like that. And immediately, the movement would be revived. So there was a regular series of atrocities that kept the free speech movement going. Of course, it was an exaggeration to call them atrocities. They were some real atrocities. This didn't happen in the 80s and they didn't happen in this country. And Gandhi would be against exaggeration, but I think he would agree that there is this dynamic and that there's nothing wrong with actually <coughs> playing on it if you know how to do that. And we'll see in the civil rights movement, uh, King himself made the decision to use children in the ranks so that when they got arrested and hauled away uh, in police wagons, everybody would be shot and horrified. I'm still not entirely sure how I feel about that. But that was an <coughs> example of using the paradox of repression in your favor. Yeah? Are there times in the movement when it would be unskillful to use that? Not necessarily. I'm sure there are times when it would not be a good idea to try to rouse the oppressor. And I'm not, <coughs> not sure how I would know how to characterize it. That's a, that's a very good question. I know that just before the 2004 for election, uh, the, uh, the person who is now president was campaigning in Jackson, Oregon. And, uh, there was a crowd on one side of the road with signs saying four more years. And there was a crowd on the other side of the road with signs saying three more weeks, uh, three weeks to the election. And uh, he must have given some order on his cell phone or something. There were two van loads full of riot police behind him. The van stopped. They poured out in full riot gear and literally attacked this mob of American citizens. All they were doing was standing on the sidewalk holding up these signs. And they beat those people. They drove them off the street. There was some video footage of them beating a 70-year-old man and uh, still beating him when he was down on the sidewalk. And if there ever was going to be a paradox of repression, it should have happened then. So it was repression without the paradox. And uh, that is a very interesting 
question is to know when it's going to go down and when it's going to backfire. I sort of the many still to be explored avenues in nonviolent strategy. As I said, this is a new science. So don't count on it, but it is there. Is it? Could it be coercive, like a using a program? That's why we were nervous about that episode. It worked yeah. most of the time, but that's not the point. The point is not whether it worked or didn't work. The point is whether it fed good energy into the whole system or it did not. And I'm still not entirely sure. There were a lot of things about, this is several weeks down the road for us, but there were a lot of things about the civil rights movement <coughs> which had to be done quickly because there were these very narrow windows of opportunity. <coughs> and I think in both of Gandhi's campaigns, there was almost never, or he chose not to regard there as ever being that kind of urgency. Always flung to principle and expected that in the long run, you'd really, you'd look back at it and you'd see that was the quickest way to get there. He said, I do not believe in short violent cuts to success. But this is not to say that he did it right, the king did it wrong. It's, it's really, you know, there are so many imponderables that we'd have to crack the ring. But as a principle, that certainly should, I think, give us pause using children. I, I can see using almost anybody else, but children don't know what they're in for and they don't know what they're doing. So because they don't know exactly what they're doing, it violates uh, person power. And in fact, let me read you a quote about person power. This comes from a woman who became an activist in what was then called uh, Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, after a visit to that island by Gandhi. And she said, it was a long, beautiful speech. I'm going to somehow get the rest of it in your hands. But at the end, she said, for God's sake, remember that you can imitate more or less successfully most things. But you can never be an imitation of Satyagraha. Satyagraha is not a matter of behavior. So you can't just you know, wear an orange ribbon or something and say, hey, Ma, look, I'm Satyagraha. You can never be an imitation of Satyagraha. You must, each of you, each of you, not all of you, each of you, light the lamp within you. You are not a satyagrahi when you follow the light of the lamp that burns within another. So the whole question of leadership <coughs> in nonviolence is very interesting. What kind of leadership uh, is it? It seems to be on a somewhat different modality than leadership in ordinary movements. Okay, so there, I guess there were two points I wanted to make with that little quote from Nanda that A, this is a paradox of repression, and B, it, it's a paradox of repression working on our, in our favor. B, it's a special type which Gandhi seemed to have caught on to quite early. And that is, you have to so organize your movement, and this fits in perfectly with what we were just saying about person power. You have to so organize your movement that it can get on without you. And this will be done brilliantly in 1930 in the Salt March when Raj arrested all the leaders, all the leaders, anybody that ever had any pretension towards leading anything. They picked them up and put them in prison and every single participant, every single satyagrahi knew what to do and was able to carry it out. That, that was really the climax of the freedom struggle. Um, so on his return to South Africa in 1909, things had shifted to the Transvaal from Pretoria. And uh, things have been going on now for three years. And unfortunately, time was on the government's side because they could take away your livelihood, put you in jail. It was like having a long, long, drawn out strike. And eventually, you run out of resources. And so because things were now in the Transvaal and because they needed some way to keep going financially, Gandhi shifted from Phoenix <coughs> settlement to Tulsa Farm, I think 
about 20 miles outside of Johannesburg, which still exists. It was, it was raided and burned and some things were destroyed in the 70s, I think the late 70s, but it's still there. And when you go back to India, he will leave his nephew, Mahamal, in charge. But uh, each of the communities that he starts has a specific purpose and it ends up serving other purposes as well. And the purpose as well, which is going to be served by the uh, Tolstoy farm, is it's going to be a sort of general headquarters for the Satyagraha. It's going to give training. It's going to be housing for people who have to leave their domiciles for the struggle. And it's going to happen in a few years. Uh, as well as being what Phoenix Farm always was, an experiment in simple living. So these are the models for the village economies that Gandhi is going to set up in India. Um, I have been thinking of applying to this new Blum Center to teach a course, actually, in Gandhian economics, which is sort of a joke. I would have probably failed the only economics course I ever took if I quit instead. Mm -hmm. It might, you know, it may have been a nonviolent solution or not. But uh, w as you'll see at the end of the semester when we get around to it, Gandhi had just a totally different approach to economics and economic life. One of the main components of it, one of the main elements was decentralization and that meant village economies. And he was experimenting with that in South Africa. And also, at Tolstoy Farm, since they were in this for the long term, and since they had children, they started what was to become later on back in India, Nye Kali. And now you're familiar with the word Kali. This is, a, I think it's an Urdu word. And if you put a, a Pashtun plural on it, it becomes Kali Ban, which literally but here it just means students. And Nye Kali means new education. And this will be one of the planks in the constructive program on school itself. So he had often said if he had it to do over again, he would like to be a nurse. Uh, but it also his vocation clearly was that of teacher. If he hadn't out being arrested all the time, he would have made a very good teacher. And Gandhian education still flourishes if we had time, I would <coughs> show a video called Gandhi's India, which is about the economic policies, how Nehru departed from them, and what the result of that was. And they interview several people who were still doing Gandhian teaching in Gandhian schools in various parts of India. Basically, the philosophy behind Nai Kalim is that uh, education has to be connected with realities. So, spiritual realities, you start the day with a prayer session, but they also like if you're learning math, you learn your math in conjunction with selling the wool or the cotton that you were also involved in growing in the village school. So it's not like this really abstract approach that we specialize in here. I, I remember when there was a severe unemployment shortage, I was walking off the campus and when somebody was holding an enormous thesis that they were trying to sell. What else are you going to do with a PhD thesis? You don't need it for a doorstop because you've already got your old computer for that. So he was trying to sell this thesis called Theory of Unemployment. You know, here's everybody starving to death, and he's explaining the theory of why they're starving to death. So Gandhi wanted to get the education very much grounded in pragmatic realities. There were other parts to it, too. Um, and this is, becomes a kind of uh, dismal period where they're just being ground down and they haven't been, been able to find an issue around which to really struggle. But two things went on they are going to turn this around. Uh, King George I was coming up for his coronation. <laughs> There's that name again. <laughs> King George I. He was coming up for coronation. And on these occasions, Brits like to have things tidy. So they didn't want to have this nasty struggle going on. In South Africa, they became conciliatory, put some pressure on Smuts to back off a little bit. 
So between about May of 1911 and on into 1912, there's kind of a truce. So the Indians aren't doing anything, and the government isn't thinking of any new atrocities. And then the big event of 1912 was, of course, the visit by Gopal Krishna Gokhale. Now, he had real position in India. He was a member of the Royal Council, which meant that he was actually going to South Africa with plenipotentiary powers. He could negotiate with smugs. He wasn't just there to pluck up the good spirits. And the Boer government, which could at times be really, really nasty, decided to give him royal treatment. They put a train at his disposal. It's sort of the equivalent of a limousine today uh, or an airplane. And he went everywhere with Gandhi, saw everything. Gandhi and he struck up one of those incredible friendships that really Gandhi was the world, famously. Between him and Gokhale, they practically, you, you can hardly draw the line and say, here's where Gokhale leaves off and Gandhi begins. They were so tight. Now, if you saw the movie, the Atvara movie, he's the guy sitting on the bench when Gandhi comes back at that cocktail party. He sees Gandhi dressed in Indian clothing, and he says, now I can die in peace. And then eventually his life is start. He's a better actor than I am. <laughs> a little subtly. <laughs> but he's, he's stunned when Gokhale says it. But that was, in fact, their relationship. And Gokhale, in fact, was to die months after Gandhi got back to India, the beginning of 1914. But uh, it's a funny thing. Uh, for all his astuteness and all of his uh, authority that he was carrying with him from the secretary for the rice boy, back in India, Gokhale did not know the Boers as well as Gandhi did. There was something it's funny. You know, here's Gandhi, he's so incredibly idealistic on the one hand. The only thing that's keeping this whole movement going is his enthusiasm. He, he had flagged the whole thing with Blair. He, Gandhi, is seeing this thing as a titanic struggle between two civilizations, must never be given up. Practically the only one who sees it that way, he's carrying it through. At the same time, he's also incredibly clever politically. He's, uh, in that film that I just mentioned, Gandhi's India, there's a delightful interview with a man named Paddy Quinn, who was Gandhi's jailer. So he got to know Gandhi well. He saw him quite a bit uh, back in India. And one of the things that Paddy Quinn says about Gandhi is, you know, you couldn't sell him a pot, which I gather is an Irish expression for, you know, you could not pull a fast one. Uh, he, he, he did his best negotiating from behind bars. Anyway, Gokhale and Smuts had a meeting, and Smuts said, well, you're right. There were, there were then, I think, three issues on the table. Uh, the, of course, the old pass issue, do people have to take out registration cards if they're Indians? The immigration question that they had, the Indians had refused to consider at one point because it was a uh, fresh issue. And the old issue, of the impost that you had to pay when you left indenture. Now that had been whittled down from 25 pounds, which was astronomical, to three pounds, which was still unaffordable. If you were an indentured laborer in the mines, you didn't have three pounds in assets to come up with at the end of your indenture. So although it looked more humane, it was having exactly the same effect. Because obviously the mine owners didn't care about the 22 pounds they wouldn't be getting from you. They cared about the five more years of labor that you would owe them. So those were the three issues. And Gokhale was promised by Smuts that all three issues would be resolved. The tax be abolished, the racial bar on immigration would be abolished, the Black Act would be repealed. He went to Gandhi and said, well, I've done it. If you can, mission accomplished. Oh, no, sorry, I shouldn't use that expression. Uh, and you can, come, you can come back to India soon. And Gandhi says, somehow, Krishnaji, I don't think so. Any questions? Um, well, the, the Transvaal was still part of the British Empire. And 
therefore, <coughs> the Lord Harding, who is the Viceroy in India, is a very important member of the British cabinet. <coughs> and in fact, on two occasions, Harding had come out on Gandhi's side when they were struggling over this. And Smuts was furious with him. But nonetheless, he, he could wield various kinds of influence. Maybe not quite directly, but he could talk to the crown. Okay. Any other questions so far? Mm. Another thing that had happened along the way, incidentally, was the imprisonment uh, had gotten really quite brutal. They were, like Gandhi had several months of hard labor with their breaking rocks, you know, in the sun all day. And he regarded it as a very important part of his sadhana, you know, his spiritual development. But it was hard on people, and people did die. There were several people who he memorializes as having died under the harsh terms of the imprisonment. And that meant that the public was starting to get agitated about it. Yeah? You said that the Viceroy was Viceroy, mm -hmm. Viceroy was the uh, representative for India in Britain? He was the representative for Britain in India. For Britain in India? Okay. Yes. And then do did Indians have any like political representatives in mm. India? This is a good question. Did India have any political representation that mattered anywhere? <coughs> you know, basically not. And this will be a big issue because the British will be trying to set up councils which will ultimately be talk shops. And so it created a question that's going to lead to a serious division, which we'll get to. It's in uh, 1926, and it's called the Patna Surrender. I mean, should you take these partial things that they're offering us, or should we hold out for a complete victory? And it's very much like the question we were asking before, when is the time to push, when is the time to chill? This becomes a strategic calculation. But it almost split the movement in India. Now there was the Indian Congress Party, the Congress Party of India, but of course it had no political uh, power directly. It, you know, if the entire Congress passed a resolution, the Viceroy would have to look at it. But they were very good at looking at it. You know, the, the thing, the, re the reason the British Empire lasted so long was they were not heavy handed. They were only heavy handed where they felt they absolutely had to be. And one place was Kenya, and another was in the northwest frontier, where they really got that they were scared for their life and they felt they really had to crack down violently. They always had that option at their back. They're the ultimate sanction, as it was called in. Roman war theory, ultima ratio regum, the last recourse of kings, was the massive violence. They had to be visited on people brutally, but they tried not to use it. Will be revisited? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering about Viceroy and like what exactly his role was. Well, uh, there's two problems here. It, the first is his role is a little fuzzy. And the second is, I'm a little fuzzy. I'm not sure I entirely understand it. But he had been sent to South Africa by the Viceroy. He was part of the Viceroy's commission, which was advisory, to be sure. But it, it has some importance. You know, it's not nothing. Although it, theoretically, the entire council could say, your lordship, we think this is a dumb idea. And his lordship could go and do it anyway. But you wouldn't want to play that too often. You know, to politicians. For one thing, you then bear total responsibility if it is in fact a dumb idea. So yeah. just to get it straight, so the British left India with no political infrastructure pretty much? Or like what happened to their infrastructure? In their uh, when the British came to India, it was not a nation state in the modern sense of the word. Mm -hmm. There were probably two types of political organization in India, though I bet there were others that I'm not aware of. But they were the Maharajas, and they were princely states that I think about a third of the country was in control of these very petty kings. Because they were petty, they called themselves Maharajas, which means terrific kings. Uh, and that was called uh, British India. 
And they, the Maharajas were mostly left on the throne unless they got up it. So it, it'll lead to some very complicated negotiations toward the end. But then the other institution was known as the Panchayat. Uh, Panchaya. And as you can see, the word punch in here means five. When you drink punch, it's supposed to have five ingredients. It's a contract. Cultural innovations that the British took back. Anyway, to get serious, uh, Panchayat was a council of five elders that would rule, or uh, rule maybe too harsh a word. They would be the governing center of a village. You have to realize there were 700,000 villages in India. It was, it was very decentralized. If you read the first sentence of Rabindranath Tagore's book, called sadhana, sadhana means spiritual practice. The first sentence is, India was a forest civilization. It was organized in these small units, just extended families, clans, gotras, villages, panchayats, so forth, with a lot of differences in one region to the next. Now when the British came in, they either didn't understand this and thought it was no form of order at all, and they were walking into a vacuum, or, or they did understand it, but they, they realized that they could replace native authority with centralized authority. So uh, they liked Gokhale. Remember, when Gandhi gets back to India, and we haven't gotten there yet, <laughs> in a few years he's going to return to India to the hero's welcome, the viceroy, Lord Harding, will send him a congratulatory telegram. The idea is you have helped us to reform the empire. You're a great servant of your people. And it's like taking a street in Berkeley and calling it Martin Luther King Way after you had the FBI pounding the guy practically <coughs> to death. So I'm sure that the Raj was a little bit nervous about Gandhi, but they didn't really regard him as a troublemaker until Shankar. Okay, so Gokhale comes and goes, and no sooner does he go than uh, everything that he has negotiated with Smuts is revoked, which goes to show you, you know, how much power he actually did have, Gokhale. And the Indians really did not know what to do when this marvelous boneheaded decision comes down on March 14th of 1913 where Justice Searle decreed that only Christian marriages are valid. Now, again, this is a subset of the general principle of the paradox of repression. It usually works well. OK, here's, the, here's something. Paradox of repression works well when you violate a deeply held norm or feeling on the part of your victim population that you are insensitive. You all remember the, uh, the East India Mutiny? I'm practicing my y'all. John from Dallas for a couple of days. What, uh, do you happen to remember, or have you ever encountered what started the East India Mutiny? It was that they, the kind of breach, they just brought in these breech-loading rifles. And uh, I mean, I'm very bad on military hardware. But apparently what you have to do, or you have to put this cartridge in your mouth and yank something out and stick it in the gun. Well, OK, except that it was wrapped. They didn't have uh, the stuff that they used for rifles today. It was special lubricant or whatever they used. Can't remember. They didn't have it yet, so they used lard. And the Muslim soldiers were outraged. And that actually sparked the mutiny that almost swept the British Raj out of India. The fact that it didn't is why we still call it a mutiny and not a freedom struggle. <laughs> the Indian historians do not call it a mutiny. But anyway, it was repeatedly the case that the Europeans in India did not appreciate the depth of passion that Indians of any community had about their religion. And so this is one of the first clear examples of that. Oh, you know, how much will they care? Well, they were in a state of utter outrage. 
and that had the immediate effect, and this is quite significant politically, of bringing the women into the struggle. Because Kasturba did not like the idea of living in sin with her husband. She probably had problems even living with him legally. Uh, Jess, I've sung that little song for you. It goes, to live with a saint in heaven is a matter of bliss and glory but to live with one on earth was quite another story. And sometimes Gandhi was no picnic. Anyway, up to this point, the struggle had been mainly the role of educated Indian tradesmen, free Indians as they were called, as opposed to indentured Indians. So it was a small part of the population and it was only the men. So this is qualitatively as well as quantitatively different. So suddenly the women came into it. I would say that it isn't just a question of doubling the population. If you carefully read Gandhi's thoughts on women, you will see that he felt that they had a special aptitude for satyagraha. Incidentally, there is a little book called All Men Are Brothers, which of, there are probably six or seven different collections of Gandhi's general writings. For a short one, that's well chosen. I've always liked this one the best. All Men Are Brothers. It was uh, UNESCO brought it out. Everybody wanted to jump on board and publish that. It has a nice section <coughs> on women. So his feeling seems to have been that in order to be a satyagrahi, first requirement was to bear suffering patiently. And whether you regard this as an essentialist fact or a cultural fact, it is a fact that women seem better able to do this than men. It can conceivably have nothing to do with genetics. We could conceivably turn it around in, in a week of really bad television advertising. But the, our point is not how it got that way, but that it was that so that the bringing of women into the movement was not just a doubling of the resource pool, but a bringing in of a qualitatively new dimension in such argument. And Gandhi later on will boast of how the women faced lucky charges in Gujarat and so forth. And in, in fact, there is a principle in nonviolence of turning vulnerability They seem to be able to play that card more naturally and more successfully. Not only that, poor Justice Searle, I mean, this was clearly the most bonehead maneuver, maneuver in the history of the British Empire. Not only that, but what the women decided to do with Gandhi's cooperation was to challenge the past laws, the immigration laws, by going illegally into the Transvaal from Pretoria, the Orange wherever they were, in small groups. And now here's an interesting little wrinkle. The first group that went in contained women from the ashram whose names were very well known to the British, to, uh, to the colonial authorities. And they decided that when they were stopped at the border between Charleston and Folkestone, they wouldn't give their names. Because if they gave their names, they wouldn't be arrested. So here's a very interesting gray area that I'm sure you can write whole theses on. Uh, here you are clinging to truth, and yet you're telling a lie. So is that OK? I don't propose to stop and solve that issue right now. I just want to flag it as something interesting that we can come back to. But anyway, they knew perfectly well that the minute the police heard who they were, they would not be arrested because it would cause too much of a flap. So not in order to protect themselves, but in order to endanger themselves, they refused to give their name. They were arrested. There was a flap. Another group said, OK, this is working well. We're going to go in, too. So the second group goes in, and the second group goes to Newcastle, or Newcastle, I'm not sure what it's called, in the UK. Now, what is Newcastle famous for? Anyone? It's, I have to give you a hint. It's a fossil fuel that we should not be using anymore. You've heard the expression? Someone's heard the expression? I guess. Don't, 
vocabulary is just kind of shriveling away here. Ever heard the expression carrying coals to Newcastle? Well, Newcastle was an actual city, and they did coal mine there. And that's why, you know, it's an absurd thing to do, to carry coals to Newcastle. So the dramatic point that I'm leading up to is that the women decided to talk the coal miners into striking. That was a big deal. This was really striking the blow at the economic part of the system. And the system's economic part is a lot bigger than its compassionate heart, its medical heart, its any other kind of heart, as King also would discover. If you can get your hands on their uh, finances, they will sit up and take notice. So at this point, things really got brutal. The, uh, this is the reason Attenborough chooses to portray this uh, as kind of the emblem of the movement <coughs> in South Africa. Uh, a total of 5,000 men, with, uh, or 5,000 men, women, and children would eventually find themselves not only off work, but with no place to live, because they were living at the sufferance of the mine owners, who lived in cabins, which were none too luxurious, you can believe. And what the mine owners did was they quickly cut off their water, cut off their electricity if they had any, and then basically, uh, when the men left, they did not have any. So, <coughs> yeah. The question is why would Gandhi have not uh, wanted the uh, cooperation of the white miners? Yeah, I think yeah. Yeah. Um, here's another example of the same thing. In the first part, uh, the first Satyagraha prior to 09, the other Asiatics who were also affected by the legislation wanted to join him. He reluctantly let them come on board, but they didn't stay very long. Then, more dramatically, many people have raised the question, what about the Zulus? What about the other Native Africans who were there? And he said, I, my heart bled for them, but it would have taken years and years and years to get on their cultural wavelength so that they could understand what I was doing. So this is our introduction, thank you, to an issue which I've mentioned before, but we haven't talked about at length, and that is Swadesh. I think we have time to do this. If we don't have time to do this, what are we going to do? So once again, you see our Sva word, which means one's own. And then this is based on the Desha, which means region, sort of. It actually comes from an Indo-European root meaning to indicate, to point out. Um, so in other words, the part of the world that you can point to here, this, this here is mass bread. <laughs> That's your data. And E is it's sort of an adjective, oops, <laughs> mm, having to do with. So some people have felt that this was the most important uh, principle after Satyagraha itself, that if you could rock Svadeshi, you would really have a key <coughs> the whole thing. And I'm not contesting that. It just might well be true. What it ultimately means is that we're we find ourselves born into a particular situation. And remember what we were saying about the deepest theory of action, we have certain strengths and weaknesses as an individual. Well, if you try to go beyond the circle of your competence without dealing with those strengths and weaknesses, you, everything is gonna collapse. If you're building a house of cards. The right way to proceed is to deal with your capacities and incapacities and let them expand slowly and naturally. So when your circle gets wider, it's also 
more solidly based. Okay? So this is kind of the inner dimension of civilization. But all of Gandhi's vocabulary, and there's a book on this if you're interested, had la layers. And the outer layer of Swadeshi, skipping a couple, three layers, was that it just meant geographically the region. So in India, for example, when they decide to boycott British goods and buy only Indian cloth, khadi, that's an example of Swadeshi. Self-reliance. Uh, a young man came to Gandhi at one point and said, I want to join the movement. Now, anyone else in the whole peace movement that you've ever known, you can predict what they would say. Like, oh, thank you. You know, let me give you a lot of work <laughs> and pay you nothing. Uh, but Gandhi said to this young man, where are you from? And the guy named the village. And Gandhi said, I've been in your village. It's a cesspool. You go back and clean up your village. For you to come here and join a national struggle and leave your village in that condition is a sin. Wrong language, the Mahatma. So on various levels, cultural, economic, political, and ultimately personal, spiritual, you were supposed to build up from within and not overreach your capacities. So this then is the explanation why Gandhi did not try to do anything for the African is the explanation why he decided not to come to the United States and do something for originally African populations who were in bondage here. They asked him, and he said, if I come to America, I will lose everything here and gain nothing there. Whereas if I stay here, I may be able to create an ocular demonstration, which other people then can use as well. So it was a question of it would have taken decades for him to get them to understand him. Of course, in India, they knew what kind of category to put him into. He was a Mahatma. He was a karma yogi. And they may not have used the word, but they recognized that intuitively. So when he said, when we go on, when we do without something, we're going to get more power, they immediately understood. So that's that's the answer. Only I forget the original question. Oh, yes. <laughs> the original question was, uh, there were sympathetic Europeans at various levels. And if, if the European-born mine workers had joined him, it would turn into a labor struggle. And it would, turn in, it would mix up the whole formula. It would change the equation. He wanted everything to be kept very, very clean. Once you won, on the ground that you were fighting on. Of course, you don't use that vocabulary. I know that. But once you succeeded in the circle that you find yourself in, then it can expand. OK. So here we have a unique, once again, uh, you'll see over and over again that an extended nonviolent campaign is a mix of planning and serendipity. Adventitious scroungers, as they call them in anthropology. You have to grab what you can grab, what comes your way. You have to be opportunistic, but at the same time, you have to have a long-range plan. So this was an incredible opportunity, if it were not an incredible problem, that suddenly he was faced with. 5,000 people had no work, no resources, no food, no nothing. What was he to do with them? So on November 6th, 1913, they began the Newcastle March, sometimes called the Great March. The Gandhi's purpose was to march them into the Transvaal, which was illegal, and to house them at Tolstoy Farm. Now, I've often made the point that people think they're imitating this when they like march on Washington, when they march on Khazar Stadium, or something like that. But there's an essential fact that we're forgetting, which is that we don't have any concrete reason to do that, and neither of those two places has anything to do with the issue. Whereas here, they had to go somewhere. They really physically had to go somewhere to live. 
and they decided that they had the right to go somewhere which the government decided they didn't, so they were doing something illegal. And so it, on at least those two levels, it was quite concrete and not just symbolic that they were marching. I, I find this is one of the most important things that the peace movement today has to address. And on this march, there were real episodes of brutality. In fact, uh, we all know about the description of the attacks of the marchers at the salt camps in the 1930, May of 1930, which was reported by an American journalist and was widely regarded, is widely regarded today as the climax within the climate. Salt Satyagraha was the climax of the freedom struggle and the attack on the Doris and the salt camps, or the raid, or whatever you want to call it, was the climax of that climax. And when the, the colonial police, it was actually mostly Indians who did it, beating people mercilessly all day long and people not resisting, as this American journalist uh, said, this was the, the end for Western imperialism. And they put it quite that way. But they've done their worst, they've done their worst, but head to head, and you can now see that the West is bankrupt. Well, actually, there was a very similar attack at least one on the marchers, not as well known to history, but there was a European there who writes about it in his journal, where the people were sitting by the side of the road and there was a mounted charge and they were just ruthlessly beaten and they did not even attempt to ward off the bullets. So this is, this is heavy. This is what we call the nonviolent moment when violence and nonviolence clash in a very open and obvious way. We like it to not be so heavy and hurtful, but it sometimes is. So now the demographics of the struggle takes on yet another dimension, because we have the women and the laborers who have not played an active part in the war. So this probably from a Marxian point of view, this was a very important development. And a lot of arrests are going on. On one occasion, Gandhi was arrested four times in two days. <laughs> in, order to, in order to stay arrested, at one point they had him arraigned and they, were gonna, they wanted to book him. And the constable behind the desk says, okay, what's the charges? And nobody knew. So Gandhi says, oh, I can tell you what the charges are. And he gave all this evidence against himself so that he could be arrested. And all the leaders were taken off and put in different places. Uh, Gandhi was at the Bloemfontein jail in Orange Free State, or Orangia. Kallenbach was taken to Pretoria. Kallenbach was really a close lieutenant to his in those days. And Polak was taken to Germiston jail. And again, the hope was that they would not have the comfort and the ability to uh, strategize among the three of them. And of course, the laborers would know what to do without them. But once again, that did not work. And finally, the attention of the outside world began to break through. Now, this again is an issue that purists like me feel a little bit uncomfortable with. The issue is this. Theoretically, the force of satyagraha should be so clean and self-acting that it should not rely upon an outside party. It should just do it. And Gandhi will make these marvelous statements. Uh, you, all it takes is one satyagraha. And if he or she is completely pure, or however he understands that term, the outcome can only be victory. But the fact of the matter is that you both, you need both. It's, uh, there are times when you need numbers because nobody can relate to anything else. And very importantly now in the modern world, there are times when you need outside support. This, there's a technical term for this in sociology. This is called the reference public. have you and your opponent uh, on a stage 
putting on a show of the two kinds of power that you represent for the, the public to wake up and understand what you're doing. So I would like to say that the movement just swept through to victory, the smuts just completely won over, and so was everybody else on the side, but it didn't work out. In real life, you need to awaken your opponent's conscience, and sometimes you cannot awaken his <coughs> conscience in time without bringing in pressure from outside. However, what makes it okay is that they didn't do it for that purpose. They didn't deliberately plan it. It, it happened in the natural course of events. People were learning about this all over the empire, which is about two thirds of the globe at this point. And uh, they were beginning to feel a lot of sympathy for the Indian struggle as they didn't have before. Um, talking about three sides. We're talking about the Satyagrahis, the government, and the world. And you could say, you know, the world in South Africa, the European public, the entire empire looking on at this thing. And I guess we're saying the same thing at both levels. We're saying that you want to persuade rather than coerce, but also in the real world, there are times when you can't wait to persuade. The example that I would like to think of in this connection is the, out, is the voting out of power of Augusto Pinochet in Chile. Uh, I give you my rock bottom guarantee that Pinochet did not go out saying, oh, I was such a bad boy. Que malo hombre estaba. <laughs> he did not say that. I'm, I'm sorry I tortured all of those people. I, I bet that he didn't turn a hair. Um, but they had an opportunity to get him out of office. And I'm not saying that they should have stopped and sat him down and talked, uh, talked it over with him until he left voluntarily. The only occasion that I know of where a whole regime more or less walked out voluntarily was India. It was the freedom struggle. And even there, hadn't been exhausted by the two world wars, there's a good chance that you would, another Churchill would have come and said, we intend keeping what we thought. <laughs> so let's put it this way. In, uh, in a small enough encounter, when you have enough time, go for complete persuasion. But in a larger encounter, you're dealing with a lot of people the issue starts to get close. You have to move a mass of people, it's already not a pure Satyagraha. In fact, when we're looking at him, Swaraj, for Thursday, you will see to your surprise and perhaps shock that Gandhi felt uh, that there were some problems with democracy as we currently understand it. Not we currently, here we here, we don't understand it at all. But even <laughs> as it was understood then, there were problems with it in that if you had to operate in political parties, you were already abrogating the will of the individual. So you had to do, to do what the party said meant you have to sacrifice your individual judgment. And to not do what the party said would be to render yourself irrelevant politically. So when you get up to big numbers, there has to be rough compromises. But I think what he was aiming for was to get the picture clear enough that people could see that there was a new kind of place there operating. Okay, so let's see, where were we? Uh, there were two events now uh, in rapid succession that are gonna bring things to a successful conclusion. The first one is that the British are putting pressure on Smuts's government. The whole world public is getting aroused. Remember that little scene from the movie in the Champeron episode where the governor says, back home they're writing essays about them. So, you know, kids in school writing essays about somebody could be a powerful mechanism. 
And all this is going on. And what does a politician do under these circumstances? They always do the same thing. They decide that there's going to be a commission. They'll inquire into the subject. And this commission was set up. Back in India, everybody was thrilled. They thought this was a great breakthrough. You took one look at that commission, and you, you looked. There's not a single Indian on it. Uh, of, of the whites who were on the commission, three of them were notoriously anti-Indian. One of them was the guy who organized the mob scene at the SS Purlan when Gandhi was coming back in January of 08 and almost killed him. And this is the commission that's going to decide how to resolve the issue. So Gandhi made a decision that they would not cooperate. They would not give testimony. They would boycott the commission. What's interesting here is not only did he risk alienating Lord Harding, who said, Gandhi, we're never going to be able to get you anything better than this. You know, this is the best you've got. Use it again. And he said, no, I, that would violate keep the Indians in the same position that they started out, of being passive victims with no voice, no ability to speak, no ability to negotiate, as though they were constitutionally incapable of uh, reason. So it's on that very deep level that he decided, no, we can't participate in this. So not only having spent years and years winning the good graces of the Viceroy, did he risk it, but he also went against Gokhale. Gokhale did not understand the situation as well as Gandhi. Gandhi had to tell him, you know, if you were here, you would see it my way. But since you're not all I can do is ask you to trust me. We are not going to join this commission. So it looked like it's, it's deja vu all over again. We've got another stalemate. When uh, an interesting turn of events comes up, as uh, so another historian, Constance de Jong, put it, the movement would not give up its principles just to get on with a ripe moment. So they're hanging there in that position when all of a sudden the British railway workers decide to go on strike. They announce that they're going to strike. This is almost as bad as a coal strike. Of course, trains are not really all that useful without coal. But nothing is going to work without a uh, rail system. When they threatened to go on strike, that really embarrassed Smuts's <coughs> government. And immediately, Gandhi sent Smuts a message saying, OK, we are going to call off Satyagraha for the time being. This is, he'll do this two or three times later in India, especially World War I, World War II. Uh, I have a feeling we've kind of discussed what the principle is here. Whether we actually did it or not. Anybody? Why? This is called, okay, I'll give you the technical term for this and I'll see what the reader did not say about it. It's called non embarrassment. Okay, uh, why is it so important not to embarrass your adversary? And actually, this is one of the things that differentiates principled nonviolence from strategic nonviolence. Yeah? So, just, just thinking about the whole idea that you want to sort of like take it to that easy end of like the struggle with you guys are friends and not like anything. Good, good way to approach it. Your goal is not to win purely and simply, it's to readjust the relationship between the person, the opponent, who feels alienated. If you don't end up converting your enemy into a friend, you really have not succeeded in Satyagraha. And there's nothing that will keep a person from being a friend more effectively than disrespect. Mm -hmm. Joy? It 
is sometimes impossible to win a person over. The point is that you, you not, I'm not saying, if I did say it, I didn't mean it. I misspoke. Uh, I'm not saying that unless the other person feels that you're his friend, you have failed. I'm not quite saying that. I'm saying that you have to keep that as your primary goal. It's even more important than whatever the issue is, the three pound tax, the immigration, whatever it is. The person must not be, you must act in such a way that the person will no longer be alienated. What they're gonna do with that, you cannot control. So. That is very well put. The, the, the bad part of any conflict, the part you've got to resolve, is the duality part, where there's, a, there's an element of dehumanization, disregard between the one party and the other. That has to be the main thing that you're trying to fix. But you're quite right, Joy, that in the end, sometimes the other person will not come around. There is uh, this famous story in the Mahabharata, it's a huge epic in which the Bhagavad Gita is embedded. At the end of this epic, uh, the hero of the, I don't want to use the term good guys, it's been very badly <laughs> misapplied of late, but the, the Pandavas, so the side of Krishna has joined, their hero goes to heaven, they have heaven also, and they also ask you who you are. When you arrive at the gate, you have to show your photo ID, you swipe your card quickly through the <laughs> slot, and they ask this person what his name is. Uh, he gives, he decides to give his epithet, which is a Jaka Shatru, which means he whose enemy has never been born. That is, he who has no enemies. And the gatekeeper, Chitragupta, he looks down and he says, look, this, they've been, there's like thousands of corpses of people who've been trying to kill you for the last 18 days, and you're saying you had no enemy? And the uh, Jaka Shatru says, they may have hated me, but I did not hate them. So it's in that sense that you have no enemy. It does not mean that you can ultimately control the other person in terms of their attitude. But I will say this in addition, that what you do will have an effect on that person. What we're really arguing about is not whether it will have an effect or not, but rather will they own it. You will have caused their mirror neurons to fire off. And whether they decide to smile or not, that's up to them. too surprised, Joy, to hear that this is not the first time I've heard that argument. Uh, in fact, I just heard it yesterday when I was doing a radio interview. Lots of people think that there are some people who can never be won over. Now, personally, I don't think so. However, we don't have to argue about that. In fact, we don't have to argue about anything. I think I can say without fear of contradiction that the number of such people is so small that if you had a sane culture, you could isolate them to such a degree that they would be powerless for political purposes. That at least you can certainly do. Personally, I believe that as long as you're breathing, you have an atma, you have a self, and that that self can be reached in some way. The practical question is, can it be reached in the 21st century, you know, while we're still alive? Maybe not. But that doesn't matter politically, because that cannot be used as an argument why, quote, nonviolence won't work, let's abandon it. Uh, okay, my favorite example of this uh, now is that at the end of the Montgomery bus boycott, they had famous 
organized, the White Citizens Council was ready to concede, and then they did, in fact, decree that the buses would not be segregated. Somebody got, uh, got angry and threw a bomb. However, on this occasion, nobody paid any attention. Oh, another bomb, rats, and they went back to work. And the result of that terrorist attempt was com it completely failed. It, it did not affect anything. So the British have known for some time that when there's a terrorist attack, you play it down and you get on with the problem. Play it down and solve the problem. That's the technique that's worked for decades in Britain. And of course, we did exactly the opposite. Play it up for all your world and don't say diddly about the problem. So on and on it goes. I hope you read that intelligence report or the unintelligent report about the intelligence report. I was in the local newspaper. 16 intelligence agencies have said that the result of the Iraq war is that we're in much greater danger and there's more terrorism and al-Qaeda is bigger than ever. So obviously, they didn't watch the webcast of day one of Pax 164A. <laughs> not have made that mistake. Okay, well, we're almost to the very end, so let me uh, just wrap it up quickly and, and share this famous quote with you from one of Smith's secretaries. When Gandhi said, we will suspend satyagraha, I don't think they have the term non-embarrassment yet. That's what we call it today. What it, meant, what it did was it gave Smuts the opportunity to give Gandhi what he wanted without losing face. Okay, look at the handsome concession that they've made. They've been carrying this on for eight years of terrific pain. It's a drain on our exchequer. Uh, you know, we can't go on with it forever. They have decided to step back, so let's, let's meet them halfway. And uh, sure enough, um, by the time uh, Gandhi returns in uh, July 18th, 1914, he departs <coughs> from South Africa, 21 years since that night in Lawrence Court. Um, he has gotten assurances that the tax will be repealed, the color bar will be repealed, and the pass laws will be repealed. Now, the long term, the aftermath is that after a period of time, the situation is not going to be all that sweet for the Indians in South Africa. But by this time, Gandhi will be distracted by India, and he can't go back. He leaves Maginwal to try to keep things on an even keel. Even though there's some backsliding, I don't think we should say that the movement was a failure because it, it did so many things that were absolutely impossible before they started. Indians could petition, Indians could litigate, Indians could struggle. It had never before been possible in the colonial era. They could force concessions out of a brutal, entrenched government. And the big thing, I think, is, and unfortunately, we have no direct way to measure this, but I'm positive that the reason that you have a democratic regime in South Africa today and that it was reached without the kind of violence that attended similar revolutions in other parts of the world was because of that model. They knew that they, they, people of color had done it in that country before. Tolstoy forms sitting there reminding them every day. And so I think that the future of South Africa was much, much brighter for what Gandhi did there. Of course, the main significance is that he's now perfected this mechanism to India. But I just wanted to close with the words of one of Smuts's secretaries. I do not like your people and do not care to assist them at all. But what am I to do? You help us in our days of need. How can we lay hands upon you? I often wish you took to violence like the English strikers, and then we would know at once how to dispose of you. But you will not injure even the enemy. You desire victory by self suffering alone, and that reduces us to sheer helplessness. Okay, well, I know that you have copies of Hind Swaraj, or should be able to get them, so give that a read. We'll look at it and start the video.